All right. I believe we are we're broadcasting. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello, booksellers. Welcome. I am Andy Richardson. I am the general manager at Fountain Bookstore in Richmond, Virginia. I am beyond thrilled to be here with this amazing panel tonight. Um, first off, I would like to thank our sponsors for this panel, Simon & Schuster Books for Young Readers, Scholastic Press, Balzer & Bray, and Catherine Teagan Books. Um, booksellers out there, uh, you've been doing this for a day or two now, so you know this, but say hi in the chat, get excited, tell us all where you're from in there, just have all kinds of fun. Um, say hey to everybody. Unfortunately, we won't have time for audience Q&A, but we will pass along any comments to the authors after so they can see everything that you want to pass along. Got to be kind, though, of course. Um, so I'm, I, let's, let's get on with it. Uh, I am here tonight with some amazing young adult suspense, horror, sci-fi. I'm going to say genre writers here. We've got some great folks. Um, first up, we have Tracy Dion. Tracy is a New York Times bestselling and Coretta Scott King, John Step Two award-winning author of Legendborn. We are talking about her newest one. It's the only book I don't have behind me because I read a digital arc, Bloodmarked. It is out from Simon & Schuster for young readers. There we go, Tracy. It's, oh my gosh, I know a lot of you have read the first one and are ready for the second one, and I can just tell you, you are not going to be disappointed. We are also joined by Lamar Giles, who is here. His new book is, he's got the best creepy background, The Getaway, and that is from Scholastic Press. When I tell you I could not put this book down, I would stop at a chapter, look at my husband and go, oh my God, this book is crazy, <laughs> and then get right back to it. <laughs> Lamar is the author of The Getaway, Spin, New York Times Editor's Pick, and I, I'm not going to go through the whole list. You, we all know we've got some great folks here. Um, Scholastic Press, as I said, The Getaway. Next up, we have Justina Ireland, who is here with, oh, Rust in the Root. That is from Baltzer and Bray. Uh, it's another one. It's got magic. It's got tough, strong kids. It's amazing. We have Tiffany Jackson, last but certainly not least. Uh, Tiffany's The Weight of Blood is coming out. All these books will be out in September. Uh, the Weight of Blood is out from Catherine Teagan Books, and we'll get to Tiffany to tell you a little more about it. Y'all don't need me to hear. So I would love to start by going around the group and having you all just say hello and tell us a little bit about your book. Um, Lamar, based on where you are on my screen, we're going to start with you. Sounds good. And thank you for the introduction. Um, my novel is The Getaway. It's about a not so distant future where a young amusement park employee lives in a walled in city sized vacation resort known as Karloff Country. Um, things are all good there until the billionaires who founded the place intentionally trigger the collapse of society and reveal the resort's true purpose, which is a luxury doomsday bunker, where these cruel rich people plan to ride out their self-made apocalypse. It is wild. And Tiffany, welcome. Please say hello and tell us a little bit about The Weight of Blood. Hi everyone, and uh, thanks for having us here. Um, so The Weight of Blood is uh, set in present day in a fictional town called Springville. A world girl named Maddie, uh, who is had been passing for white uh, for most of her life at the behest of her very fanatical father, is uh, very traumatically outed by her classmates. And uh, the school gets a lot of vitriol and they decide to host their first um, ever integrated prom uh, since previously their proms were always segregated. Uh, but of course, Maddie has a secret that not many people know and uh, things ensue on prom night. Uh, so this is very much a beautiful homage to uh, Stephen King's Carrie. Yeah. Um, and the, if you didn't know that from the cover, you can tell immediately. And, oh. <laughs> yes. Chef's kiss. <laughs> Tracy, please tell us about your second book in this amazing series. Yes, absolutely. And I guess uh, the first thing I want to do is shout out to Tiffany for also being a Credit Scott King, John Steptoe winner award for new talent, because you were right before me, I think. You led the way. Yeah, I think I was like 
the the year right before yours. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Perfect. shout out for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my first book uh, in what is now known as a legend board cycle is called Legend Born. It's about a it's a contemporary fantasy story about a girl who uh, runs away from her grief and ends up at an early college program at UNC Chapel Hill, which is about ten degrees off from the actual UNC Chapel Hill. Um, it draws on a lot of the history of the school. Um, the first fictional thing she encounters are uh, demons that no one else can see. And then she realizes through the course of her first night there that the uh, secret society who hunt these demons down are called the Legendborn and they may have more connection to her mother's death than she realized and that there may be more going on than what was on the police report. Um, so there's a mystery element for sure, sort of like a murder mystery type vibe to it, um, action adventure, Coming of Age Romance, the sequel coming out in November is called Bloodmarked, and it picks up right after, like a month after Legend Born concludes. Um, there's a huge climactic um, compilation of revelations, I should say, at the end of Legend Born, and Bloodmarked deals with all of those consequences and takes them all further. We get to meet new characters, there's more magic, bigger magic, um, and a lot more challenges to face Brie and is the middle book in the trilogy. So it gets, uh, there's more suspense. I can draw attention more. There's, uh, I figure you're with me. So now I just get to take you on a ride. Yeah, you definitely got us in there. Um, and a little bit of a love triangle too, which I enjoy. Love that aspect of it too. And Justina, please tell us about your amazing book. Oh, also Tracy, I apologize for saying September. I was off on your pub month. <laughs> Justina, yes, bring it on. Um, so Rest of the Root is it follows a young mage named Laura who goes from rural Pennsylvania to um, New York City in the 1930s. Um, but this is an alternate 1930s where magic is what has been, uh, the prohibition has been about magic and about certain spells, which they call rabbles. Um, and all Laura wants to do is become a famous baker. She just wants to use her abilities to kind of have this really simple life of making fabulous desserts. Um, but it turns out that it's really hard when you're a young black woman in New York City in 1936, just like it's really hard to be a young black woman in any other time period. So what ends up happening is um, she goes and gets a job with a government organization called the Bureau of the Arcane um, and starts fixing what's called blights. And so it's kind of a way of taking the Great Depression and um, sort of unchecked capitalism and giving it this magical metaphor where we get to talk about what happens when we don't take care of our world and what happens when we don't listen to the people who are impacted most of us by the economy. Oh, and I, I know I'm gonna just keep gushing. I really cannot say enough about how amazing all of these books are. If you can get your hands on them in the galley room, y'all need to get it. So let's talk about how you all kind of got into it. What was your, your gateway genre book? And since this panel covers a lot, that can be sci-fi, fantasy, horror, wherever. Tiffany, we're going to start with you on this one. So the question is like where I even like your, started? Well, your, like, your gateway. So what did you first read that really got you into genre books? Um, I you know what, I guess I would have to take it back to like, um, like, I was about to say things that go bump in the night, but like, <laughs> like Arl Stein books, um, Wait Till Helen Comes, um, The Doll, like, all these like horror books that I like basically started when I was a child, like a baby baby. Um, I, I basically, those were my gateway into it. I really wasn't interested in any other genre. I found all other books boring. Um, and I basically went from, you know, reading Arl Stein straight to Stephen King and like Mary Higgins Clark. I didn't have anything in between. Um, so I, I guess that was sort of the gateway where I, I skipped all these other books and went straight to like what, what I just wanted to read about. So yeah. I love it. Tracy, how about you? What was your, your gateway book to get you into reading genre stories? Um, the first time I think, I mean, I'm sure there was something in the picture book world, you know what I mean? Like chapter book world when I was younger, but the first time I, I really thought like, oh, these types of books, this type of story, I want to go for more of these was probably uh, Dealing with Dragons by Patricia C. Reed, which is a classic, but also shout out to Jeremy Thatcher, Dragon Catcher, a Dragon Hatcher. I don't know if you'll remember this book, but Jeremy Thatcher was about a kid who just like hatched a dragon and it was a contemporary fantasy and it has like very much never ending story type vibes 
Um, but I just remember thinking, this is cool. Like it takes place in our world. Um, that was probably my first introduction to contemporary fantasy. Um, and I think I was nine or eight or something like that. Excellent. Justina, how about you? I was actually just turning around to see if it was near me because I figured it was. So. Love it. Um, this is my, my introduction to genre. It's a book my grandmother gave me when I was a kid. It is called The Dwindling Party by Edward Gorey. And it, it's a pop-up book about a family that gets murdered on vacation. And it is literally, um, the when I got my, when I sold my first book, um, I went and found a, a, a vintage copy of this book because it's out of print. It's like, it's, it's a collection, a collector. But it's literally so funny because if you can see at the beginning, like the, the big, there's the family. And then that's who's left at the end. It's not a final girl, but it's definitely a final boy. Um, so this was definitely my first introduction to genre as a, as a little kid. Um, but the book that really made me want to be a writer that I, I still recommend to this day is a historical fiction book called My Brother Sam is Dead. And it's really about this kid whose brother goes and joins the Revolutionary Army. He, um, he goes AWOL and comes back home. And then the Continental Army chases him down and hangs him in the front yard. And I was just so entranced with this book as a kid because it was a version of history we didn't get to read in school. Um, so of course, you know, what does a brain do but combine the two things that you love? And so why not history and things like people disappearing <laughs> terribly? on vacation. Yes, I, Edward Gorey is just classic too. Lamar, how about you? What was your gateway? Um, probably the Mysteries of Harris Burdick, um, the Chris Van Allsburg book that's, got, it's the story behind the book is a mystery and each page is like a, a beautiful illustration, a title and a line. And it's sort of up to you to figure out what's going on because all those pictures are so strange and creepy. And I just remember having a lot of fun as a kid trying to make up the stories that would accompany them. And from there, it was a pretty straight line from to Stephen King, to Tanana Reeve Du, to F. Paul Wilson, to all sorts of wonderful horror writers I'm into now. Um, I wanted to be a horror writer from the very beginning and sort of took a winding road to get there. Um, but th that one is definitely the one I think about first. And I think we're all like making notes because our TBRs are just growing and growing as if we needed that more in this conference. <laughs> so next up, I'd love to know more about what draws you to writing stories for younger readers. And Tracy, we'll start with you on this one. What draws you to writing the, the 18 and under type stories? Um, you know, one of the things that I really like about particularly young adult literature, which is, you know, where I'm focusing now is that um, there is a sense, generally speaking, not all the time, and I love it when people break form and genre, so there's that, but that generally speaking, I think there's a sense that uh, the character, the core of the character, a characteristic that they already possess, beliefs that they may already have, something about them, a kernel of them is good enough. Uh, for the challenge that they that you're about to set forward for them um, as the writer and that you're about to join them, you know, the journey you're about to join them on as a reader. There's something about that that is good enough. And I feel I find that young adult literature is really good about sort of affirming that there is a part of the main character, the protagonist that can carry them through a challenge that they haven't even met yet. Um, and I find it really affirming um, that there can be this element of that storytelling. I think it's why a lot of adults like to read young adult literature to get that sense that like they can take on the thing, even though they have a lot to learn and there's gotta be, you know, there's setbacks and all that stuff that like there's a part of them that is, uh, that is whole in the middle of the, of the journey. I find that that's the through line that keeps me reading young adult literature. I love it. Justina, how about you? Yeah, could you repeat the question? Because I do not remember it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. What is it that draws you to writing stories for younger readers? Because you've done some middle grade and now some YA. So you've you've done a little bit of a lot of different stuff under in the under. Yeah, yeah, I have. It's it's really weird because like their brain kind of my brain just kind of dumps the stuff that I've already done and it's always thinking about the future. Um, but I really like I fully believe in that Madeline Langle quote, if, if it's too difficult for adults, you write it for children. Um, and that's really kind of where I've, I've been and where I am is that there are questions I have about the world, about just how things are. And it feels like sometimes when you want to write in that, the adult space, adult readers bring so much baggage with them, right? They bring 
<laughs> they bring like a whole caravan of baggage with them. Whereas younger readers, if you read a zombie book, for example, younger readers are like, this is my first zombie book, or they're not expecting certain things. And I really like that, that you can, you can go into a story without, without talking down to younger readers, but also without having to navigate the minefield of the reader's baggage. And I think it gives you a cleaner read. I, that's why I enjoy reading middle grade and young adult books more than adult books, because I don't have to kind of say like, wait, what are they really saying here? Um, like there's, and I, I never also, the, also the bigger thing is I always get an ending that's satisfying. I think a lot of times in adult books, like the ending is just there to piss you off. <laughs> and I don't, like I'm already angry enough. I don't need to carry that with me through the day. Like just give me something where everything, even if it's not a happy ending, where it feels like there is something that can happen next that's going to be a little bit better. And that's really why I like those, those categories. Excellent. I, I think that's a perfect way to describe it. Lamar, how about you? What draws you to writing stories for younger readers? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell a bit of my history here. I'm 42 now, and I don't remember hearing the term young adult until I was in my mid-20s. So growing up, I just never heard of this particular designation for books for children. It seemed to jump children's books right into adult. And so when I started to hear this term, and I always wanted to write, and I was always curious about what was going on, started to hear this term, started to hear that they, they, there were these great young adult books. I'm like, well, what is this? And I ended up looking into some of the things that were popular at the time, and I ended up stumbling across, I think, some Neil Shusterman books. And I, maybe Unwind was the first one I read. And when I read it, I was blown away because I didn't know you could write that sort of socially relevant and creative thing for young people. I feel like it wouldn't have been allowed for us to read it when I was young, um, the way things were in my hometown at times. And I got excited about the idea of being able to contribute to this sort of creativity for this age group. And I remember thinking, I wish this stuff had been around when I was their age. Maybe there's something I can do here to make sure no one else ever has to have that wish. Yes, I love that. And I do feel like we should say that just because a book is young adult or middle grade, any age can read it, of course. We have a book club for adults who read YA because there's a million of us and we love a good YA book. <laughs> Actually, The Weight of Blood is going to be coming up in our book club in the, the next couple of months. So Tiffany, tell us what, what inspires you to write to the younger readers. I guess I could piggyback off of my peeps here and say like, yeah, I feel like I, I one didn't know what young adult was until I was querying, like funny story. My first book, allegedly, I only queried as an adult novel and I was getting rejected left and right. And it was Tahari Jones who told me, it sounds like it's a YA novel. And I said, I have no idea what that is. Um, so like I stumbled into this genre, but I also feel like it was very kismic in a lot of ways. Cause I feel like all the stories I wanted to tell was for younger Tiffany, um, the, the girl who wanted to see herself on the page, wanted to see stories that took place in like city landscapes or in horror novels. I wanted to see, you know, a black girl like make it to the end. And so I guess that was a huge part of why I wanted to write these books, but also of course, um, knowing that a lot of, a huge part of my readership is actually adult. Um, and they too also uh, get angry at the endings of my books uh, for good reasons. And so I respect that. But um, I think what's the interesting thing is even though, yeah, we talk about like that this is like YA and stuff like that, you know, it should be for kids, but yeah, a lot of adults read it. I also want to point out that we should really be talking about the fact that a lot of adults are reading books that they should have had when they were younger. And so a lot of adults are reparenting that inner child and saying like, look, like, you know, this girl went through something that I was going through and had no answers for. There were no texts. There was nothing that really like addressed these type of problems that I was dealing with. So I think that's really important that, you know, just because it has an age group and it doesn't mean that you as an adult person can't um, learn from it and sort of validate some of the feelings that you had that, you know, maybe people brushed under the rug. Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent point. And it's, you know, as somebody, when I was growing up, there just, there wasn't any diversity in YA books. I mean, I had Babysitter's Club and Sweet Valley High, and that's not how normal humans live. And that doesn't represent any sort of diverse characters. And it's just, I think, 
even as an adult, just being able to have those stories accessible, it just opens your mind up to how other people felt when they were growing up and it teaches you to be more empathetic to other people. So with that, my next question is what you would hope a reader would take away from your book. And Justina, we're going to start with you on this one. What would you hope your readers take away after reading your book? Honestly, I just want people to have a good time. Like, <laughs> like I work really hard. Um, my goal is not for you to like end the book and you're like, wow, that was a thoughtful rumination on race, class and sexism in America. Like, I really want you to just have a good time. And then maybe later on, it burbles up in your brain, right? Like, I, I think the, for me, the really great books are the ones that stick with me where I'm like, you know, weeks later or months later, I'm like, ah, oh, I keep thinking about that scene or I keep thinking about like how that ending. So I, I, that's really where I want. I just want when you're here, like have a good time, enjoy the, the fun. And then maybe later on, like think about the hard stuff. Good stuff. Lamar, how about you? What message do you hope people take other than, you know, maybe watch out going to amusement parks? <laughs> well, I mean, similar to Justina, I primarily I want to entertain, like whatever you get out of the book, you get. If I had to single out a thing, and I don't think it's the only thing that's there, I want people to consider what you're willing to trade for comfort. Like what's your line between selflessness and selfishness? Because that's the big question going on with Jay the main character in my book, what can he put up with to keep his family comfortable? Um, I think it's a question we, a lot of us get posed with today um, when we see what's going on in the world around us. What can we accept in order to maintain our own comfort? What can we look away from? And I just would like readers to think about that a bit when they're not just being entertained by the struggle of those stuck in Karloff country. I also have to ask, and this is a little bit off topic, but Karloff, is that like a Boris Karloff reference or was it just a coincidence? Because that's what I kept thinking every time. No, it's, it's a Boris Karloff reference. Um, for, for, those, for those who don't know, he is the actor famous for playing um, the monster in Frankenstein and the mummy among many, many other roles. Yes, I was, I'm, I'm pleased that I caught that. <laughs> Tiffany, how about you? What would you like readers to take away from your book other than sleeping with a nightlight on? <laughs> um, I guess same with, you know, my peeps here, like, I just, I want people to, one, take away the fact that this is a horror novel that stars, you know, Black kids. Um, and, you know, it, it's a familiar story. At this point, a lot of people would know the story of Carrie. If you've never seen the movie or, or read the book, you know this story. And so it's an opportunity to sort of look at, um, and this is the first time I'm truly writing about racism. Um, and so that also, that scares me too. Um, and it's an opportunity to kind of look at racism from the lens of, of like, you know, a political, you know, moment in our high school years that we're all familiar with, which is prom. Um, there is nothing more political than prom in a lot of ways. So I thought that would be kind of interesting to sort of, you know, take that angle, but also just remember what it's like to fall in love, um, to also get you know, a sense of a deeper sense of telekinesis, because let me tell you, I studied telekinesis for several months before this book, I wrote this book, all right. <laughs> During the pandemic, I really thought I was moving pens. So I really need everyone to read this book for just for my sanity purposes. Like, can you make the books behind you levitate just while we're here? I, I mean, I try every now and then. <laughs> every now and then, like, there was a point where I think I like, I text Lamar, I was like, I need to get out of the house. <laughs> and there's too much happening. I can um, confirm. I can confirm. <laughs> it's good to have friends that you can you yes, can do this. <laughs> yes, that he understands where I was going with. Um, but also I guess like another like thought is, you know, the ending is incredibly like horrific because it's a crazy uh, ending to a prom. Um, but it's an idea also about the idea of what I mean, I guess an idea of an idea. Um, it's a thought about revenge. Like what can revenge truly look like? Um, and do we want that? So that's another. And you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this sort of a kernel of the idea came from a high school that up until really, really recently was doing segregated proms. Is that? 
Yeah, actually, there's a lot of smaller towns like, you know, deep in the south that are still hosting segregated prom. Um, this particular school um, happened to be in Georgia uh, and the CNNs, um, you know, covered their story. Um, this happened back in 2014 that they finally had their first integrated prom and it was very polarized in the community. Some people were like, you know, oh, yeah, let's just do this. And the other people were like, why are we changing things? Um, and very much just like the book, there was a, you know, an integrated prom, there was also still a white prom. So it sort of like tells a lot about, you know, society and the norm and this was very recent. Uh, and there's actually a lot of schools uh, that still continue to do that, but under the guise of like, you know, oh, this is a community event, not a school sanctioned event. So it was also interesting reading about those towns since I didn't grow up in, in a small town. Um, I also didn't know anything about football and like, Friday night lights and so I had to watch the whole series to like understand like oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah <laughs> that's excellent and I, I thought it was important to bring that up because I think a lot of people don't realize that even as recent as the last couple of years and now that that's still going on so. yeah Tracy what would you hope that readers take from your book I mean I you know I, I think that uh, the images that I'm able to create of uh, a 16 year old black girl, you know, fighting a magical war with demons and magic swords and, you know, competing in a trial. Like, I think all of those images are really powerful and I, I love being able to contribute those and sort of be able to, to craft them and deposit them in our minds. I think we hold on to images longer sometimes than stories even, and we certainly link the two of them. Um, but in terms of what I want people to walk away with, I mean, you know, Legendborn was a challenge for me to be able to write contemporary fantasy, which is my favorite subgenre of fantasy. Um, but I, it's, it had been a while since I'd really felt I'd read a story that really pressed really hard on both of those elements, on the contemporary and the fantasy. Um, you can find sometimes that people will lean more on one or the other. And I wanted to challenge myself to push really hard on both of them, sort of like with both, both, both pedals, so to speak. And I think what I would want people to get away from that effort is that Bree's antagonistic forces are both magical supernatural forces, but they're also very real ones. Like her challenges with um, racism and oppression, her challenges with particularly, you know, agents of white supremacy in the book are just as big and maybe even scarier than a hellhound that finds her in the middle of the woods at night. Um, so I think one of the things with Legendborn is being able to press on both of those things and have them be antagonistic forces that she's juggling and perhaps position those as sort of equal, but one is very more real um, in the reader's mind. That was sort of something that I wanted to work on. I think it's really, you know, you look at TV shows like Miss Marvel, you know, the MCU show, that's a really good example of a, of a teenage girl who's dealing with layers of antagonistic forces and challenges, right? Like it's, it's her family, it's intergenerational, it's, you know, what is dating looking like? What is trying to learn how to drive a car? It's magic. You know, I think there are a lot, there are a lot of kids who are dealing with multiple levels of challenges in their, in their lives and multiple layers of them. Um, and I really wanted to represent that on the page. And it's, I think, and since you and Justina's books are, are similar in that there's a lot of magic in both of them, it's being in two totally separate times where the characters are still dealing with racism in the 1930s and in current day. And also, oh, I have these powers that I don't really know what to do with. It's a whole, whole different coming of age that a lot of readers don't understand any aspect of it. So I think you all do such a great job of just putting that out there. Uh, another theme, and this goes through all of the books, is that you all take, we, we kind of don't need the grown-ups in these books, in a sense. Um, a lot of our, you know, our heroes and our heroines are young people of color, and to save the day, they can't really count on or rely on the adults in their life. So they kind of team up and, and move forward. And where I'm going as far as the question with this is, is that something that was kind of fulfilling a wish? Did you just like the, the aspect of the, the kids finding their own power? How did kind of, how did that inspire you all? And Lamar, we'll start with you on this one. 
Well, yeah, I certainly like the aspect of the kids finding their own power. And in the case of the getaway in Carlock country, the way I look at it is there's probably a few thousand people trapped in Carlock country. And in my mind, that means there's a few thousand different stories to tell. And so, like, I could conceivably go back and tell the story of some of the adults and what they deal with. But that just doesn't interest me as much as seeing how the young people in this world handle the monstrous forces around them. Um, because I think ultimately when dealing with the monstrous forces in our world, it'll have to be the young people who do a lot of the work to fix the things we messed up. I just don't think we adults have that much time to course correct. And we're leaving dire circumstances for our younger people, but they're smarter than us. They have louder voices than us, thanks to the technology we didn't have. And so that interests me more than anything else. Yep, I think I think you're right. I think it is up to the, the young people now to save what we have all ruined as adults. Tiffany, how about you? I guess it's, um, it could be a bit of like a cultural thing for me too, in the sense that like, you know, like as a city kid, like we tend to did a lot. We did a lot without adults. <laughs> we went to school without them. We went home without them. Like, you know, so I guess that wasn't really a big shift for me. I think it's a shift for a lot of kids who may have been like, who may have lived in the suburbs and need their mom to drive them to, you know, save the day and stuff like that versus like, you know, city kids could just jump on like a train and be in a whole nother borough. Uh, so I guess that that's what I mean by like, I, it was, it was okay for me to shift parents to the side. Um, but I always, in most of my books, I always had a parent somewhat present um, uh, or some type of community around them, whether it be a church community or a Jack and Jill community, like some kind of community that was always sort of cushioning these kids in a way, um, because that is incredibly important, especially, you know, in black cultures, we are very much a village and we are being raised by, you know, even the mailman has something to say about, you know, what we're doing every now and then. So I think it's also, um, I don't really subscribe to the whole, like, you know, dead parent and that's how we get what, like get rid of them. Like I definitely make sure that the parents are at least present um, because, and I also think about kids, like when I go into school visits and they read these books, they're like, yeah, how do these kids like have time for all this in between like homework? Like I got work to do. Like, and so I always make sure like kids have like homework to do because I think that's incredibly important to sort of validate their true experiences that yeah, we, we still have homework. We still have even more work than we probably did in college or at least for me, maybe I was just slacking, but you know, I think that's incredibly important to be real with kids. Um, to not kind of like belittle their experiences and think that like, you know, oh, like I didn't have a parent or anyone around that had no homework and I just, you know, kind of like did everything and everything was fine. Yeah. And Tracy, how about you? Cause we, we do have our, our heroine checks in with her dad every so often, but she's, she's kind of left to her own devices. <laughs> She does. She does check in with him and he's got really rich moments, I think, in the book when you, when you, you should get like when they're together, when they're talking, there's a really, they're really powerful moments for her. Um, so I think that's important, but I also, I don't know, I've been thinking about this and maybe someone on Twitter or something said it, but I feel like we're living in the age of like, I don't know, inter intergenerational trauma squad, like rising up and telling stories. Like, I feel like so much of what I'm doing in Legendborn, you know, in Kanto turning red, like I said, Miss Marvel, like we're seeing really interesting stories come about or we are seeing teenagers realize that they are inheriting trauma, legacy, power, confusion, grief. Like they're, they, they're coming to a realization that they're inheriting these things at this age um in that like 10 to 15 to 16 year old point so I feel like in some ways even though um you know the meat of the story might be from you know is from Bree's perspective and is what she's going through there's this heavy presence of the narrations before her all the time and I feel like that's you know I don't know what what's in the air that like a lot of BIPOC writers are just like churning through that work right now but there is something to be said for like feeling the presence and feeling the weight of being a child um, at, at the product at the end of a long legacy of other people who had other stories that are still impacting you. So I feel like, yes, it's teenagers at the front and center, but at the same time, at least in Legendborn and Legendborn Cycle, 
the legacies of those teenagers and their lives and their parents is still a heavy wave. And Justina, so your characters are, for the most part, uh, they have adult mentors in this program that they're in, but they, we're not gonna give spoilers. Through circumstances, the kids have to do a lot on their own. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's one of those things of realizing that when your life sucks, it's not just your life that sucks, that sometimes the adults in your life, their life suck too. Sometimes your friends, all their lives all suck. And so I really wanted to kind of, you know, I think, I think the Trump presidency really showed a lot of us that the work is never done, that sometimes you think things are fixed. I mean, like we just lost Roe v. Wade, right? So like you think things are set, you think things are progressing and then there's this, this backslide. And so like one of the things, you know, I wrote this book before, before we had the Supreme Court um, mess with our lives. But so one of the things I wanted to show was that even though you're making progress, sometimes it's slow and sometimes it doesn't feel like progress. And sometimes you need that older generation to tell you like, no, things are a little bit better, but they need to be even better than this, right? That they still aren't, we are, still haven't achieved equity. And so for Laura, um, she's just really in a character that's in a transitional period. And I think one of the things that, that has always kind of bothered me about YA is we don't really have a lot of um, strong female relationships, right? We tend to like like scuttle the the friends aside for a love interest. We tend to you know kill off the moms because it's an impactful emotionally. And so like I wanted to show like women can help each other. Like women can like you know guide one another. Like you sometimes you need those older women in your life to like, get you through things. And so I just wanted to, for a, for a change, instead of writing, you know, like Jane McKean was very much like, I don't need anybody, I can go solve it myself. But Laura is a little more like, wait, I think I missed something, someone clue me in. And I think sometimes it's, you know, sometimes you need both, right? You can't always be the heart charger. I think someone tweeted the other day, they're like, oh, it turns out a nation full of 300 million rugged individuals isn't such a great idea after all. And I think that's really something that we have to talk about is how important community is, how hard it is to build a community and how hard it is to sustain a community throughout generations, especially when you're fighting against oppression and you're fighting for equity. So yeah, so that's really what the reason I included mentors because I think there's always been, for me in my life, there's always been an adult that maybe didn't have all the answers. They had some of the answers, even if they were the wrong answers. <laughs> so I think that's really important. Absolutely. And I like that you, you all do such a great job of showing the effect of the past generations and their trauma and everything they've been through and how it affects the characters in various ways. But the parent figures that are all there, whether they're actual parents or just older figures, you all really do a great job of showing how all of that does get passed down. And we're just reading the story of the person that happened to get holding the bag this time. <laughs> So we'll lighten it up a little bit now, since this round of books is all pretty serious. I would love to know what you all do to, to lighten it up. So once you are done writing for the day and you're ready to kind of shake off the, the horror, the suspense, the, the everything that's going on, how do you kind of leave that behind? And Tiffany, we'll start with you on this one. I, um... I do ratchet things with my friends. No, I'm playing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, no, I, I definitely try to, uh, like, I was actually having this conversation with Victoria Aviar and she was saying how, like, you are very adamant about, like, making sure you still have a life. And that is true. I hang out with my friends. I definitely go to dinner. I travel at least, like, once a quarter to larger destinations and et cetera. I make sure I'm there for my family and all of my friends. Um, I'm helping my homegirl who just had a baby uh, six weeks ago. So I'm definitely a baby whisperer over here. So I've been bouncing um, yeah, yeah. For, for the last couple of hours. My arms are killing me. And <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I make sure that like I, I absorb as, as much like of life as possible because that's how you become a better writer is also like living your own life as well too. Um, and of course, you know, I still love, I mean, despite the fact that like horror, horror novels and horror like movies like relax me. Oh, yeah. So I'm at least watching something or some series or I go to sleep every night listening to podcasts. Um, yeah, so even though like I'm in the genre and it's still like stressful, that stress actually still like relaxes me in a lot of ways. So yeah. 
Although I am still very upset at you about a jump scare that you gave me in white smoke that I'm not going to spoil in case anybody hasn't read it. But there is something that I said a very bad word out loud and was like, what did she just do to me? I mean, that's a win. I feel like I, I've, I've won there. Thank you. <laughs> Tracy, how about you? How do you decompress and kind of walk away from, from the stress of the writing world? Um, I'll say that sometimes walking away from the stress looks a lot like moving like laterally to new stress. Um, so that's not, I would not recommend that, but, um, it could just be working on another aspect of, of creativity, whether it's like, you know, um, reading another type of book. Um, one of the things I will say that I love doing is just like reading a genre that I don't currently write. Um, so my favorite right now is like romance novels, which is not something I used to read when I was growing up. I don't know why I just, it wasn't around. And then I was just like, Oh, this is like, so contemporary romance is like the exact opposite of what I'm doing. Like it's so far away that I'm not thinking about work. Um, so there's that, um, although of course, whenever I'm reading, I am still in the back of my mind working. That's just sort of how, you know, how it shakes out. Um, but I also find other things that just disconnect that part of my brain. So like puzzles started to get back into puzzles a little bit more, um, trying to actually use the switch that I bought to play games and wind down. I don't know. Staring at it's not the same as using it, it turns out. So I've got to work on that part. Um, and, you know, just cooking, trying new recipes. I'm a horrible cook, but I like, I like follow instructions. So, um, and also it's really hard to get caught up in work brain when you're, you know, prepping food and trying to time things. Like it's, I love things that allow me to sort of truly disengage because my brain will drift back to story if I'm not careful. Oh my God. Yes. That's like the thing I start, I got into like K dramas over the last couple of months because you literally, you can't, you can't be on Twitter. You can't be on your phone. You actually have to be like reading. <laughs> you, you have to read along basically. And so to me, that was like the best way to shut down completely because I'm getting caught in these like, uh, like huge romance stories and I don't want to miss one moment of it. So that's also <laughs> same. <laughs> I love it. Justina, how about you? Yeah, so like, honestly, my work-life balance during the pandemic was a mess. Um, so I'm actually trying to get back into that. Um, I just like took all the work and wrote all the things. And now I'm just kind of like trying to pare it down. So right now, I don't know what I do. I usually just, <laughs> I usually like, I try to like match my schedule to my husband's cause he's still working from home. Um, but I like to play pinball. I have a pinball machine. Um, I like to watch anime with my daughter, um, read a lot of manga. Uh, like we go out and have fun. Like we've done a lot more travel this summer cause things are opening back up. Um, but I'll be honest. I'm like, I'll be the first to admit my, my balance and my turning off the writer brain is really, really, really bad. And to the point where I went on the first vacation where I didn't take my laptop with me just this past summer. And that's since 2012 when I sold my first book. So like, it's just like, I, I, I think whatever you can find that can like give you that relief is probably a good answer. As long as it's not like harmful to other people, <laughs> like, like maybe don't be an internet troll. Like that's sucky, but like, like maybe something else that you can do. So now I have to know what pinball machine you have. Cause I am a huge pinball nerd myself. I have the Jurassic Park um, Pro Edition. So I literally, like my husband and I get in there and we're just like, we're both big children. We still go to like to the arcade every time we go to like the shore or the oh, beach yeah. or whatever. So yeah. That's awesome. I love it. Um, I, what we can't see is right over there. I have a couple pinball machines in my basement too. So I, you said that you just made my whole day. I love Which it. Which one do you have? Uh, so I have Gorgar and that one works. Um, for those of you who don't know pinball, Gorgar was the first machine to speak and have call outs and he knows seven words. And we have an old EM called Strike Zone that does not work. So if anybody out there knows how to fix an EM, <laughs> it's tough. And Lamar, now that we have uh, gone on a pinball digression, how do you decompress? I want to know more about pinball. I will um, talk about pinball all day. You be careful. <laughs> yeah. Now, for me, in, in prior in prior years, decompression looked like video games and scary movies. But we had a baby last year. She's almost one. So now, at the end of the day, when she comes home, I'm just with her, and she's a joy. Um, I love playing with her, and it's like it's just it's it's very easy to not think about work when I'm dealing with her having a bunch of new teeth and I'm trying to make sure I keep all my fingers, that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. 
it's, but I, I love just you. She's walking now. I love reading her stories. We do picture books. Um, and that's pretty much my afternoon and evening every day. And then by the time she goes down, we're worn out. So it's sleep, get up, do it all again. I love it. I think there is nothing like a young face to, to take you out of it. Um, being a, um, I am an auntie and a godmother. And I think that however you are in a, in a little person's life, it's just so rewarding. So we are sadly getting short on time, but I have one more fun question we have to throw in um, because we are here to celebrate all of the amazing indie bookstores in the region. I would love to hear from you all which indie bookstore you consider yours, wherever it may happen to be. And Tracy, we'll start with you on this one. I knew you were going to start with me. So I've been thinking about this question because I saw it come through earlier today and I feel like I'm just, I'm just going to have to cheat because you can also name like 10. The 10 yeah. Names. Like, I feel like I don't have, like, it's really hard. Um, that's, indie that's have been so, you know, <laughs> so wonderful for me and Legend Morn is a debut. I did find out also today that Legend Morn uh, just hit in hardback and paperback 78 weeks on the indie bestseller list. So this is, I mean, that's, Congratulations. yeah, I'm really bad at flexing. It's a tiny, it's a flex, but, it, but I'm, I'm really bad about doing that for myself. But I will just say like, that's not achievable by one store, right? So that's just me saying big thank you to Indies because that's pretty amazing. That's, that's fantastic. Great, great way to not single any one person out. I love it. Justina, how about you? Who, who's your indie bookstore? Well, I'm going to single people out. Um, so Liz at Capriccio's Books has been a lifesaver. Um, she handles all my pre-orders. And so she, she has, she went uh, virtual during the pandemic and, and will basically drive books anywhere that you are in Eastern Maryland. And it's delightful. She's got the best customer service. And the fact that she can even deal with Star Wars fans, which is saying something. <laughs> um, and then I also love um, the Ivy in Baltimore and Greedy Reads, just two great uh, bookstores that are really friendly. And every time I go in there, they're like, hey, happy to find you something. So I love Indies, but Caprichos is where my heart is. I love it. I love it. Lamar, how about you? Um, well, I'm going to shout out Richmond, which is rich with independent bookstores. So Fountain, BBGB, um, Chop Suey, and Book Bar. Oh my gosh, they're, we are spoiled with amazing bookstores. And I love that you said book bar because we love Crystal. She opened up right behind us. We share an alleyway and we have customers going back and forth. She and Kelly, our owner, worked really closely together. And I, I love that you included her in that. And right on Richmond bookstores. Tiffany, how about you? There's also no lack of amazing stores in the Atlanta area. Yeah, I'm, and I feel like I'm kind of all over the place too, because I'm from New York, I lived in DC, I'm down in Atlanta, so um, I could just go down. Um, there's Greenlight Bookstore in Brooklyn, um, Adana, who just opened up um, in DC. There's East City Books Bookshop. Uh, there is a Mahogany Bookshop, uh, which they actually have two locations now. Um, in Atlanta, we have Brave and Kind books, which they've been so amazing to for all of my events. Um, I feel like, yeah, like every bookstore I go to, into, I like fall in love with it, with you guys because I'm just like, yeah, I mean, y'all are our people. So, um, and you like to talk about books and you get excited. So yeah, it's definitely, and it's a warmer experience than I get from like larger bookstores where I walk in and I have to like show my ID um versus I go into an indie bookshop they're like oh my god like, like so yeah I, I appreciate that type of uh love all around but yeah there's Starline books there's there's so many bookstores um and that's been one of the, the amazing parts of like being an author now is to like go to these different states that I would have never gone to if it wasn't for books and then actually uh meaning yeah yeah and I, I, I want to visit. I want to visit Brave and Kind. I've heard nothing but great things. Oh uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It's I also wonderful. want to visit it's loyalty wonderful. books. Oh. oh yeah, loyalty books too. And um, sh um uh, oh god, I'm blanking on a bookstore. Uh, forgive me, guys. Yeah, we'll say loyalty. <laughs> my favorite of all of the bookstore t-shirts. Um, and it's a, from a shirt. I got, I got a shirt from them that I am not allowed to wear to work because it has a bad word on it, but um, I wear it on every day off. And uh, they're my favorite of all of the bookstore gear. And I love our fountain gear. Oh, but loyalty has oh God. And, and, and books are magic in Brooklyn as well, too. Yes. I, I'm like completely spazzing on them too. Everyone knows their signs, the big pink sign in Brooklyn. And it's actually around the corner from my elementary school. So uh, yeah. 
love it. <laughs> uh, this has been just amazing. Thank you all so, so much for being here. Thank you, Siba, for putting on this great programming. And again, to our sponsors, Source Books for Young Readers, Falter and Bray, Catherine Teagan Books, and Simon and, oh my goodness, Scholastic. I knew I was trying not to read off the sheet. I apologize. Thank you, everyone. This has just been, uh, this is like a bucket list for me. I'm so grateful to all of you for being here. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Yes, and all you booksellers out there, have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. All right, night, guys. Bye.